Hello, I'm Chancellor Ronnie Green. Thank you for joining me for today's Nebraska Lecture. This distinguished lecture series features some of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's most notable scholars, researchers, artists, and thinkers. At Nebraska, we believe in the power of every person. For about two decades, the Nebraska Lectures have showcased some of Nebraska's finest scholars, people who embody the spirit of this institution and are committed to sharing their knowledge with the public. Our speakers are renowned experts in their fields. They are scholars who strive to collaborate, breaking down the barriers between disciplines. They are educators who are committed to mentoring and shaping the next generation. They are problem solvers who have spent their careers addressing some of society's most pressing challenges. I am so proud of their accomplishments and dedication to our university and the state of Nebraska. Thank you to the Office of Research and Economic Development, the University's Research Council, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and other partners for making this lecture series possible. I hope you enjoy today's Nebraska Lecture. I'm pleased to introduce Harkam Alwalia, who will be giving today's Nebraska lecture titled Changing Climate, Warmer Nights, and Crop Yields. Harkam Al is an Associate Professor of Agronomy and a Faculty Fellow with the Dougherty Water for Food Global Institute. His research focuses on crop abiotic stress tolerance, phenomics, and functional genomics. In 2019, he became Nebraska's Hearman Chair of Agronomy. A live question and answer session will follow his lecture, and viewers may email questions for him at unlresearch at unl.edu. Researchers around the world agree that rising global temperatures combined with erratic precipitation are posing an unprecedented challenge for human health and nutrition. Harkamal's lecture will present a perspective on how genetic improvements and technological advances can help address this challenge for agriculture and global food security. His major research activities include functional characterization of heat-regulated genes during reproductive development and genetic and physiological characterization of roots and wheat during drought stress. He also conducts comparative transcriptome analyses of cereal crops in response to a suite of abiotic stresses elucidating the gene networks regulating early seed development and seed size in cereals. Harkamal earned a bachelor's degree in plant breeding and genetics from Punjab Agricultural University in India in 2000, and a PhD in 2005 from the University of California at Riverside in plant biology. We're grateful to have Harkamal at UNL, and I'm particularly grateful for his initial ideas around uh, plant phenomics work that resulted in our Greenhouse Innovation Center. And I'm really looking forward to learning more from him today and his perspective on these grand challenges of climate change and food security. Without further ado, I present to you Dr. Harkamal Walia. Hello everyone, my name is Harkamal Walia. I am a professor in the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture, and today I have the pleasure of presenting the, um, the Nebraska lecture for the spring 2021. I would like to uh, start by thanking Chancellor Green, uh, Vice Chancellor Wilhelm, and the Research Council for accepting the nomination from my colleague, uh, Steve Benzinger, for uh, giving me this great opportunity to present this lecture. It is truly an honor, uh, and I hope that uh, my lecture can help uh, stimulate some discussion and spur some ideas and, uh, and is generally useful for you to read more and learn more about it. Um, so with this, uh, I will get going. Uh, I really um, think that the, uh, the idea of having a re uh, celebrating the, the research fair uh, this week uh, is very good. I also think that it's a great time, uh, one, of, one of my favorite times of the year to be in Lincoln as we see a, a lot of flower bloom uh, on trees. It's, uh, the city looks at, at, at its best uh, this week and next week. So uh, it was kind of interesting from that perspective that uh, you know, there was a, a news clip that caught my attention that the, um, the, the cherry blossom 
which was peaked in, uh, uh, you know, it's been recorded in uh, Japan or Kyoto for a very, very long time, so 1,200 years. Uh, there was a, 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 a trend that was seen in terms of earlier and earlier blossoms. So if you look at the, uh, at, at 2021, uh, it is uh, at March 26. So there's been for the last 200 years a drop in the, or you know, earlier and earlier bl peak blooms. And that sort of caught my attention because I think that's what we, uh, one of the main points uh, about uh, my talk today is the, the, f uh, the flowering time and the, and the grains that develop from those flowers for some of the major crops and how uh, temperature impacts them. Okay, so for, the, for today's talk, uh, here's my uh, outline. The first we would talk about some of the climatic factors that are impacting crop productivity. Uh, basically looking at those factors and what the predictions are and how that could affect you know the yields uh, then we will sort of zone in on on high temperature and learn a little bit more about uh, what the temperature distributions look like uh, and then finally we would uh, you know further kind of focus on uh, some of the work that our team has been doing on high night temperature stress or warmer nights hence the title you know uh, having warmer nights so why, so what we would, uh, what I would do there is like give you an overview of why we are beginning to work on warmer night and why it's important, and then some of the new technologies, both genetic and uh, you know imaging related technologies that we have developed, and how we are trying to link those to see if we can understand the crop response to uh, warmer nights uh, or high night temperature uh, stress uh, in better d uh, detail. So. As many of you uh, are aware, that uh, you know, climate is uh, is central to many of the discussions, news, and so on, uh, and so also in in the in the arena of science. Uh, what we do know uh, from uh, you know the data and the modeling is that the that the our, uh, we are getting more heat uh, waves, we are getting more flooding, and more drought events. So basically. The, the frequency of the heat and precipitation extreme events is increasing. Uh, also increasing are the, are the duration as well as the intensity. So not only do we get more of these events, but we, uh, we have them last longer in many instances, and then also they are more intense. So this all uh, you know, affects all aspects of our life, uh, you know, from where we go, what we do, and, but it also affects, uh, you know, how much there is to eat globally for uh, for an increasing population. Uh, what is also uh, predicted, you know, what's known is that these events are already showing a trend where, for many many decades now, where they're more frequent. But it's also uh, predicted that uh, the f in the future, some of these extreme events are going to continue to show that trend. That means that they're going to continue to have occur more frequently. They're going to have um, uh, more uh, intensity and cause more losses, uh, both in terms of um, uh, f uh, food production and other aspects, you know, in terms of the economy and, and social aspects. What's less known is how do we take these global trends and decide. So, so if you're a farmer and you're uh, wanting to know, okay, you say, all right, you know, I understand that there's going to be more events uh, of rain and you know, flooding, or I'm going to have see more drought. Uh, and I need to prepare for it. So is it going to rain more next year or is it going to be more dry next year? So those are things that are less tractable. However, there are instances, for instance, we do know that some parts of um, uh, South Asia, for instance, and Sub-Saharan Africa are going to be more dry and more hot. Uh, they have shown that trend and it seems like that's con going to continue. Generally speaking, it's uh, at a local level. It is very difficult to uh, at least uh, you know, uh, very reliably uh, predict what would be the, you know, the, f uh, the frequency of drought or flooding event or heat waves in the next few months or years. So with this, uh, let's kind of zone in on some of the, you know, of the factors that are impacting crop productivity and climate influences those. Uh, when I say climatic factors, you know, there's al always this discussion about uh, you know, climatic variability versus long-term trends. So we'll, we'll 
you know, so keep this in context when, we, uh, when I discuss these points. So water, as you know, is uh, essential for, our, for life on our planet. Uh, plants um, that produce uh, more, nearly all of our food di directly or indirectly uh, are about 90%, uh, 80 to 90, 95% water. So water is very essential for life and for cellular processes. And um, the process of photosynthesis, which is the capturing of carbon dioxide from, uh, from the air into strings of carbons that would form sugars that eventually serve as food source for us, uh, uh, are uh, possible because of uh, the presence of water. There's also this relationship between carbon dioxide and water where a typical plant, uh, when it opens these, it has these openings on, the, on its surface, on the leaf surface, uh, when it opens, uh, because of the difference in concentrations inside the leaf and outside in the environment, for every one carbon dioxide that a typical plant would import into uh, inside its leaf, uh, there's an inevitable loss of somewhere from 300 to 400 water molecules. It's just inherent from the differences in size of these two molecules. So, uh, however, with water, the, the challenge is that it's highly variable, so it's not very easy, as I mentioned, to predict you know, wh whether it's going to rain uh, heavily for the next five years or it's going to be a drought period for the next 15 uh, years. Uh, the it's, so next uh, component is carbon dioxide. So plants, when you dry them up, uh, are about 40% carbon. And that carbon is derived from the environment. And the uh, therefore, in, uh, you know, changes in con concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are inevitably going to impact the, uh, you know, how much carbon, less or more, that the, the plants would uh, uh, take up. And then, fi you know, finally, among the abiotic factors that are very important is temperature, which is both, again, linked also to carbon dioxide, as I would elaborate shortly, but also, uh, you know, if you have higher temperatures in the air temperature, it inherently increases the capacity of air to hold water, which means that you're going to have a bigger drive to, uh, to get the water from the soil as well as from the plants, uh, so in, you know, resulting in more uh, drought-related uh, stresses. So these are some of the abiotic stresses, and I'll, uh, that's kind of an area for my research, uh, which is to look at the abiotic factors uh, in their impact crop productivity, trying to understand what the mechanisms are. Uh, there are also biotic factors. Uh, that I won't touch on, but clearly changes in temperature, moisture, uh, impact uh, the incidence and, uh, and the frequency of crop diseases and pests, and that uh, clearly uh, is an important aspect, again, with lots of variability in terms of changes in domain of these uh, biotic factors. So what we do know for sure in terms of when I was talking about you know, long-term trends, what we do know is that the uh, the carbon dioxide concentration uh, is going up uh, and over the years, and the this results in uh, you know many many uh, benefits because if carbon plants are uh, are trying to capture this carbon dioxide, the more carbon dioxide there is in atmosphere, it should be able to take advantage of that, which many plants also uh, do. Some uh, you know there are plants such as wheat and rice which uh, we predict could benefit from higher CO2 concentration, whereas others that are, uh, such as uh, maize and sorghum, which already have a mechanism of concentrating carbon dioxide, are, uh, are, le are likely to benefit, but less, to lesser extent than you know, some of the, uh, the other, like rice and soybean and wheat. So however, with rising uh, CO2 concentration, there is a challenge, and that challenge is uh, that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. Uh, so if you think of Earth's, uh, a blanket of uh, atmosphere around Earth's surface, uh, most of the atmosphere is made up of oxygen and nitrogen, but about 1% of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, 1% of the atmosphere uh, is made up of greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is uh, the major greenhouse gas. And it's an advantage for life on this planet because carbon dioxide, along with other greenhouse gases, would trap the long, ra uh, long wave radiations emitted by our surface uh, and reflects them back 
uh, keeping the, uh, the atmosphere warm enough for life to be possible, and also you know, sending some of those, the heat into the, uh, on, into the outer space. So the problem is, as carbon dioxide concentration increases, as you are seeing, it's very evident, and we know that for a fact that it is, uh, the, the, the temperature also start to increase. So here's the, um, a graph that shows the, uh, the, the you know, uses the baseline of 20th century, so the average is at zero, and it, it, show, it tracks the, uh, the anom anomalies in global temperature from 1880 all the way to 2000, and you can see that the trend um, in the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years is that most of the temperatures are above, so above the, the average. So because of the increasing carbon dioxide concentration, uh, one of the ma major drivers uh, uh, for this in anomaly or increase in, uh, in temperatures. So this uh, complicates uh, things a little bit uh, for plants and plant processes. And you know, it also does for, you know, not only for plant physiology, but for human physiology or any other life form. Um, so I wanted to uh, show you uh, you know, this uh, animation which shows from the, essentially the point that I made uh, where it uses a 30 year uh, average as a baseline to, um, to show the changes in temperature. So if, it's, uh, if the parts of the globe that are blue are below that average and parts that are, will turn red are above that average. So if you look at this, uh, these are five year averages uh, and the baseline is derived from 1951 to 1980. So as you can see that there's uh, you know, a, a gradual increase in, uh, in more red. Of course, there's you know, some bouncing around. Uh, and now it's more blue. Um, so this kind of shows you, the, you know, how much the temperature has uh, uh, you know, increase and what kind of distribution it has both over water and land mass. Um, with, you know, so what does that really mean in terms of, uh, you know, if the average temperature changes by, I say, 0.6 or 0.8, uh, does that make a difference? You know, intuitively, not. To us, you know, if we, uh, uh, if we experience a 0 0.6 degree increase, so it's instead of, you know, 65, uh, at home, if it's 60.5.6, it probably doesn't make a difference. Uh, but when you think in terms of averages, you also need to see how the sh there's a shift in this graph. Uh, you know that increases the you know the mean. So if you look at the y-axis, which is the probability of occurrence, uh, you would see the shift in graph, which will result in less cold weather events, which is really good for crops because if you have uh, extreme cold weather, such as we had one in uh, in February, uh, the there's a pretty big loss for crops that are out there in during that time. For instance, winter wheat crops have been hurting uh, because of that uh, very cold uh, window. However, what is more worrisome is that the shift brings not only uh, more hot weather, but it also turns these into you know events or in, uh, that become more you know, record hot weather, and that really is devastating for crops, especially when it uh, these occur during flowering, when, which is when in terms of cereals, uh, a lot of uh, grain formation takes place. So, so in terms of what really is happening uh, at the physiological level and at the molecular level, uh, 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 with rising temperature in plants, there are many, many aspects, but I could think of these three or uh, four as the main uh, ideas. First is that the rate of respiration increases. So if we, if, let's say if you are in a really comfortable environment listening to me, uh, you know, 65, 70, uh, if we were to raise the temperature of the room by another 10 degree or 15 degree, uh, you would clearly be respiring at a higher rate. To meet the the metabolic needs of your uh, of your body, uh, so similarly, increased respiration uh, due to rising temperature results in carbon loss. So uh, when when organisms respire, they take in oxygen and they release carbon dioxide, and so f that higher level of carbon dioxide loss from plants, especially when they are in the form in the stage of grain development, is uh, is quite detrimental. 
because the uh, photosynthesis, which is the process that fixes these carbon molecules uh, from, carb you know, from carbon dioxide from the air into these uh, sugar molecules that are stored uh, in many cases either as sugar or as starch uh, and oils, uh, is something that we consume and, uh, as you know, plant products for our food. So losing some of that carbon simply because of higher respiration rate that plants have to now maintain due to higher temperature uh, is very detrimental to, uh, to the crops. And further, as the temperature increases, as I mentioned, the capacity of the air to around the, uh, on the plants to hold water increases, so it draws more water out. Uh, through uh, water loss from the surface of the soil as well as from the, the openings in the plant surface. Uh, the third thing is that uh, is the developmental acceleration. So what plants, many of those crops are annual. Uh, when they experience stress, they shift. They accelerate, uh, yeah, they accelerate uh, and their developmental events. And when they do that during grain development, which is the time when the plant is actively bringing in carbon from the air and trying to push as much carbon as it can into the seeds uh, or tubers, uh, the, uh, that acceleration compresses that window because the plant has this escape mode in many cases. Uh, instead of uh, you know, just delaying it, it would actually try to escape. And that results in uh, smaller grain filling periods. So those are windows or time, time frames when the grain is actively being uh, uh, filled with starch and proteins and lipids and oils. Uh, so that really is detrimental. And then also higher temperatures bring in uh, more cellular maintenance costs. So what does that really mean? Uh, so I could, you know, it means there's many, many aspects to it, but the aspect that's more Im most important that I think uh, is to do with this um, remarkable uh, enzyme uh, called Rubisco. So Rubisco is the, is the enzyme that's central to doing the magic that plants do in terms of drawing in carbon dioxide from the air and turning it into you know, food for itself and also what we use for consumption. So Rubisco, uh, as the, if you look at the first graph, um, the, you know, there's the temperature uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the x axis. The, uh, as the temperature increases, the, um, the rate of uh, Rubisco turnover increases. So that's the green li uh, gr uh, line on, the, on your left graph. Uh, as the turnover in uh, rate increases, what that means is that more and more Rubisco gets degraded more quickly, so needs to be made uh, more quickly. And that's kind of an inf impact of temperature, so it slows down the whole photosynthetic process. What you also see is a broken orange line that's going downwards. Uh, that, call, that is uh, called Rubisco specificity. And what that means is that Rubisco, which is you know, uh, probably a fundamental protein, um, probably also the most uh, abundant protein on this planet, as far as we know, um, is, the, uh, is also able to react with oxygen. So like, very, you know, like many important things, Rubisco has some issues. So as the temperature increases, Rubisco starts to like interacting and, and you know, accelerating the, 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 uh, the, the reaction for uh, oxygen uh, to, to bind to the molecule uh, uh, that is the carbon chain then rather than the carbon. So if we don't add an extra carbon, uh, that's a carbon that opportunity that's lost. So the plant ends up spending a lot of energy and going through various cycles to recover at partially uh, some of the carbon that, that's lost because the oxygen won over in that particular reaction compared to carbon dioxide. So as the temperatures rise, the Rubisco's uh, you know, likability for uh, promoting the carbon dioxide reaction so that you know, we could get an extra carbon dioxide, carbon added to a carbon string that uh, towards its way to make uh, sugars uh, is decreased. So that really uh, hurts the plant and is energetically inefficient and it uh, also um, impacts, you know, basically it's a temperature impact. Uh, so what it also does, if you, if you look at the graph on the, on the, um, on the, uh, on the right, uh, it shows that as the temperature increases, uh, is this, you know, around 30, 35 degree, the, um, the rate of photosynthesis drops, primarily 
uh, because of what I mentioned about Rubisco's turnover rate and specificity, but the rate of respiration continues to increase. So this combined effect of, uh, of higher temperature on dropping uh, rates of uh, fixing carbon and increasing rates processes such as respiration that are in the business of losing carbon, uh, you know, that, that converge and that results in a physiologically challenging situation uh, for, uh, uh, for plants as the temperatures rise. So what does that mean in terms of uh, global crop yields? So I have summarized um, the you know, results from several models from this paper um, where they predict that for every one degree increase, what's the percentage of yield loss? So if, if, the, if the global temperatures increase by one degree, it's expected that you know, the lo lo losses for wheat would range from around minus six, uh, you know, so by 6% drop, and rice would be somewhere around three, and maize would be around seven, and soybean would be around 3% uh, again. So what we do know is that, and what's very concerning, is that the, these four uh, crops com uh, combine together to provide about 66 uh, or two-thirds of the calories that we consume uh, uh, as humans. So, the, uh, so it's a really big deal every one degree increase if these models are you know, somewhat accurate. And there's, this, is, this data is derived from multiple models uh, uh, that were published by this paper. Uh, the, it, it can have a really big impact on global food availability, food security, and other things that follow, which are more social and economic when there's not enough food. So what my research has been interested in is, is these two major uh, cereal crops, uh, wheat and rice, which wheat is the most widely grown crop in the world, and rice is perhaps the most uh, uh, important crop for food security, as uh, many nations and regions in the world uh, that are not that uh, developed and um, are not rich uh, depend on rice for the f for sustenance. So, to give you an impact of how much temperature can impact, uh, you know, affect the the rice yield. So, one of the components of yield is how big is the seed. And if you look at these uh, uh, the seeds on the top, are seeds uh, of rice that we pluck out when it has only developed for 24 hours, and the next one uh, is the one that we pluck out when the, you know, it's, uh, it's 48 hours, and then there's 72 hours and 96. So what is very noticeable here is that the seed size is increasing, you know, fairly uh, strongly over uh, each day. And, uh, and that is increasing seed size is really important uh, during this stage because if you, do, if you disturb the stage, the seed's not going to become as big, and then it's not going to have the potential to store as, mu as much uh, carbon in form of starch and proteins and, and so on. So the, what we did do is that when we had the exact same collection, but after 24 hours, we put some of the plants at 42 degrees centigrade, which is fairly high temperature, but it's not uncommon to see that in many parts of the world where rice grows. So what we do see is, and these are comparable uh, images, so you could see how big a difference there is in terms of a 96 hour uh, rice growing in very good uh, temperature uh, and the one that's being heat stressed. So, so that was kind of very striking for us and, and also when we look at these seeds or what are the outcomes of these seeds uh, under, um, at maturity, which is when you let them develop after, after removing them from stress, uh, what we found was that even uh, a 35 degree moderate stress, uh, you, if you look at the top panel which is not stressed, and the, the second panel is the one that has 24 hours of heat stress and 48 hours of heat stress and 72, and then they, they're kept in good condition. So these are one, two, or three days worth of stress at 35 degrees centigrade, which is very, very common in many of the rice growing regions uh, in South Asia. For instance, so you see that there's a dramatic decrease in size and also the quality. And of course, if you have a stress as severe as this, uh, you get a lot of deformity and pretty much no seed at all. Uh, so, so what do we do when we see that a, a crop that is so important for food security and is very, very sensitive during some stages of its grain development, how do we address this and what are some of the solutions? So when you're thinking of solutions to, 
kind of laid out broadly or somewhat broadly. You know, uh, as temperatures rise, there's clearly adaptations that farmers uh, have been doing in terms of planting times, and you know, breeders have been also incorporating better genetics. Uh, but you know, there's uh, but there are decisions that the farmers uh, will have to make in terms of regionally will have to make in terms of what they grow, and at what time of the year they grow, and you know whether they uh, and where they grow. So you know whether they have to move some crops north and other crops south. You know that that would really uh, be uh, you know one aspect of uh, you know, trying to address this rising temperature. Uh, the other aspect would be use of genetics. Uh, the genetics is very powerful because we do know that uh, not all rice grow in optimal conditions like 28 or 30. There are rice and wheat and corn that grow all in very you know, hot environments. So if we can, they may not be as productive, but uh, if we can discover what helps them maintain, or what are the genes and the, and the proteins that help them maintain and survive in those uh, hot environments, uh, we could use genetic technologies to discover that and then maybe even try to incorporate some of that. And that's modern plant breeding is all about incorporating those, you know, uh, uh, those traits into, uh, into um, the crops. And so there's also technological improvements that can uh, help with accelerating the genetics as well as independently uh, promoting, you know, better uh, mitigation of rising temperature on crop yields. Uh, besides that, you know, something that I won't discuss is also the, you know, uh, as I said, that it's difficult to, even though the global temperature is rising, it's difficult to address that, um, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, at a global scale because at regional level, the farmer's going to know, am I going to get a heat wave or what do I do in this situation, which may be different from a farmer that's, uh, you know, 2,000 miles away from this particular region. So you know, there's got to be some uh, discussion, and I'm sure there are discussions being held about building resilience at local scale that still you know, takes advantage of the things and the trends that we know at global scale. So what I uh, and uh, my colleagues have been focusing on uh, in terms of the genetics and rising temperature uh, is the idea of uh, high night temperatures. So the reason that we want to uh, try and understand uh, the plant responses to high night temperature uh, a little bit better is because of this. So if you look at the, um, at the distribution of temperature anomalies for 112 years uh, globally, uh, so here are the, uh, the anomalies for the daytime temperatures. So blue means cooler temperatures. Uh, compared to the average, and red means the uh, higher temperatures. So the more brighter red it is, the higher the temperature is. Uh, and if you look at the nighttime temperatures uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of these, uh, you know, of the global uh, landmass, the what we find are skew, two key differences. One is that the there's a lot more of red on the nighttime, and that indicates that the uh, that the nighttime temperatures uh, are more widespread. And the, uh, the other aspect is that uh, it is also very uniformly distributed. So there's not as many patchy, patchwork of red uh, as there is for the daytime temperature. So what that led us to think is, and, you know, and it's spurred by uh, you know, evidence and discussion in the literature um, among the scientists, is that the, um, th that the uh, that the higher nighttime temperature might be a better uh, trait to uh, to try and understand and improve, uh, and uh, because it could actually be having a bigger impact rather than day temperature, which can go up and down and are very spotty. So this is the temperature distribution uh, or extremes for for the U.S. Uh, and you could see that the uh, that on the, the average maximum temperature would be the uh, the would be on their on your left, and the average minimum temperature, which is the night temperature, uh, are on your right. And you can see that a lot of the red, which is the higher than average uh, anomalous temperatures, uh, are uh, are you know for the night time. And also, if you look the uh, the number of years that have had uh, higher uh, average minimum temperature are a lot more since 2000. So that plus the fact that the, you know, when we think we're thinking of rice, there was a, several papers that suggested that 
uh, rice uh, yields are very sensitive to nighttime temperatures and that for every one degree increase in the nighttime temperature during the growing season, you could get up to 10% drop in yield. Uh, not only is yield important for rice and many other crops, but so is also quality. In terms of rice, the milling quality uh, is, is quite important and um, for, because it impacts the, uh, the cooking and, where and what price the farmers get for, uh, for, for their crop. So further, as hybrid rice takes off, which is you know, basically about 90% of what U.S. Uh, farmers grow for rice, uh, you know, it is even more susceptible to, uh, to heat stress in general. So what we did was we, we put together a team of scientists that was as diverse as I could possibly imagine in terms of you know, people from computer science, quantitative genetics, metabolomics, image analysis, people who, like me who do a lot of our work in the greenhouses as opposed to people who uh, do a lot of their work in, in the field, agronomists as well as educators. Uh, to, uh, we put this team together and we uh, seek funding from NSF, which is the Science Foundation, uh, uh, to build a center for wheat and rice uh, heat, uh, for heat resilience. And this is a multi-state team. And our goal was to, uh, to try and search for uh, rice varieties and the genes that uh, underlying those rice varieties that may uh, be more tolerant to higher nighttime temperature. So the way we started doing that is that we built a set of infrastructure which is, as far as we know, is very unique it's in, in the country and probably globally, uh, of these large tents. So this is a wheat, winter wheat tent uh, set uh, in uh, uh, Kansas State uh, where we uh, w keep these tents on top of the crop and we grow uh, a large variety of winter wheats uh, uh, that are available publicly. Um, and we test them by closing these tents during nighttime and increasing the temperature by three to four degrees. What we found was that on average, uh, winter wheat, uh, you know, this includes about 30 of the varieties that are from the Nebraska's uh, wheat breeding program. Uh, we find that about 5% uh, decline in yield for every one degree increase in temperature, which is only imposed during uh, the flowering. So a similar experiment uh, and set of tents are also uh, being run uh, in the uh, in Arkansas State uh, uh, University uh, team, and we are also finding a lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, rice lines that seem to either be very sensitive or very tolerant. And what that helps us do is it helps us take our next step in terms of trying to figure out why they are tolerant or sensitive. So the way we are doing this for rice, which is going to be the focus of what I will talk now, uh, is that we are using about 400 varieties of rice from all over the world. As I said, that not all, many parts of the world grow rice, but not all of them have optimal temperatures. So we're hoping that from studying these uh, wheat, uh, rice varieties, we can uh, discover uh, new insights that could lead to genetic discoveries of, uh, of high night temperature tolerance in rice. So we take these varieties. These varieties also have a lot of gen uh, genetic resources, so basically DNA sequencing information available for, uh, for these lines. And we tested them uh, in our greenhouse conditions in, in Nebraska. So we heated a greenhouse at nighttime and kept a parallel set of plants without heating, um, you know, so basically good temperature. And what we wanted to see was the flower of rice, so kind of going back to the theme of uh, you know, rice flowering. What we find, uh, so for that, we needed to develop a set of imaging systems so we can very, you know, in detailed manner, very uh, minutely pick up changes that we otherwise could not pick up from our, uh, you know, naked eyes. So for this, we worked with uh, our team uh, members from computer science to develop this uh, system for imaging just the rice flower, which is called the panicle, because it's the panicle is the seed bearing uh, a cluster or flower, you know, of uh, organ of uh, of rice. So this imaging system will go around and take images and give us uh, ideas on how the uh, the rice is developing under high night temperatures. So we did this for several uh, uh, hundred uh, hundred rice lines, and several, so it, which eventually turns out to be you know several thousand plants. 
uh, you only see the panicle here because the rest of the plant's underneath, but it's alive and we image it again and again over the grain development. So doing this, we, using these multiple uh, images from all angles, we can 3D reconstruct the panicle, which is shown here, uh, so that we can look at the surface area and other features. So using this information, uh, we were able to derive uh, about 30, 35 digital traits. These are traits that are not easy to describe, but the, uh, the software that we developed can extract them, and, and we should see that they are different among different varieties. So we use these to map, and here's an instance of how we map. So it's basically a genetic association map, so it shows the 12 chromosomes of rice, uh, and each of the chromosome uh, has a mile, many, many thousands of mile markers. So in cumulatively, we have about uh, 1.2 million sequence, DNA sequence-based mile markers, and we ask the question, our software stops at each of those markers and asks the question whether, you know, is, if you have this marker instead of that alternate marker, does it make a difference in this trait? And, you know, using that, we were able to discover, for instance, one gene that uh, has been known to, uh, you know, to, to determine how tight this cluster is. So if you look at the one, if this gene is deficient, you get this uh, very tight cluster, otherwise you get this very branchy. So that shows that our method's working. And so at the at moment, we are following up on three or four of these genes to see what their role is in, uh, in uh, heat tolerance. Uh, in addition, we also looked at the grain size. And um, grain size, of course, is a contributing factor to yield. And what we discovered with a similar approach, but just uh, you know, looking at just single grains instead of the whole grain cluster uh, on the flower, uh, is the, that the genes that we uh, see under control conditions that control the grain size are not always the genes that can do the same for under, under heat stress. So one of the genes that we discovered from this is called the, uh, the 5-1. Uh, the 5-1 uh, gene shown here uh, as a marker here is not seen when there's no stress. So essentially it's on chromosome 8 and uh, what we next thought was that there's two genetic variations of this gene. So we call the type 1 uh, variant which is the big M and big, uh, you know, big M, big, uh, uh, big uh, M1, M2, M3, M4 and there's a type 2 variant which is the small M1, M2, M3 and M4. What we found very striking was that the, when you expose these different variants to, uh, to heat stress, the varieties that have the type 1 variant seem to activate this gene, whereas the varieties that are, have the, the type 2 variant deactivate this gene. So that uh, was very striking. So what we did next was we used the CRISPR uh, technology to make mutations in this gene. And what we find is, is quite striking. So I'll show you the, uh, this is your control, which has no edits. Uh, and it looks, the starch looks quite crystalline. And so it's got this very nice structure. But if you heat stress this, you see how the starch turns into these small uh, globular things with lots of air, you know, air part, uh, packets in there, which kind of shows up as browning when you look under a light box. However, if you have this uh, gene uh, mutated, even under control conditions, you see this very disrupted packaging of starch, which means it's not fully packed in, so it's not as nutritious. So even though it may look big, it may, the seed may look regular size, but inside it's not got the nutrition in the right packaging as well as in the right amount. So this is one instance of how we are using both the imaging technologies and also the genetic technologies in terms of trying to discover what makes rice uh, you know, more sensitive and also tolerant to high night temperature. Uh, so as to summarize, you know, we've talked about carbon dioxide and higher temperatures. Uh, we also talked about imaging and discovery of genetic variants using imaging. And more importantly, what we do know is that the chances of breeding for higher temperatures needs to be done in higher temperatures, not under optimal conditions. And of course, you know, the story that I briefly mentioned about the 5-1 gene. With this, I want to thank the tremendous amount of work uh, and that, uh, or that's been put in. I have the good fortune of working with uh, you know, these talented lab members. Uh, this is our team from the NSF funded project from Kansas, Arkansas, and Nebraska. And also, you know, um, what makes the, the, you know, the, it tru truly a pleasure to work in Nebraska 
uh, is you know uh, many of these people listed here who have had the great opportunity of uh, learning and uh, 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 learning from and working with and I really en have enjoyed that experience. With that, uh, thank you for your uh, attention and I'll be happy for any questions. Well, thank you, Harkamal, for sharing this research with us. We should all be concerned about how these temperature changes could impact our global food security and we should be proud as a university to be conducting world-leading research in this area that are part of two of our grand challenges in our N2025 plan. Because Nebraska is such a strong agricultural state, these shifts have the potential to affect so much about our future here. Thank you to all our viewers who joined us today to learn about changing climate, warmer nights, and crop yields. You're certainly welcome to submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen or by emailing unlresearch at unl.edu. So Harkamal, great lecture, yeah, you know, thank wonderful, you, wonderful uh, uh, presentation of what is a major issue and, and challenge for us ahead in global food security and it was certainly your work in the in the major cereal crop arena uh, is a big part of that. You know, I, want, I wanted to start maybe to, with a few questions that might help our, our viewers understand this, the way this science has developed in recent years. Um, you, you, you talked about working in rice principally, also working in wheat um, in your program. Um, these, these crop species, so if you take rice, for example, or, or wheat, what, what has the technology looked like in terms of the ability to do the kinds of genetics work that you do? Uh, how has that developed? So for, for example, you know, rice and, and wheat, how, how well annotated are those genomes? You know, what, what's the platform really that you have to work from? Yeah, I think the, that's a very good question, Chancellor Green. Um, I think the, uh, the, the fact that rice uh, is, is such an important crop, but also the good fortune that when the genomic technologies were, sequencing technologies were just taking off, uh, rice also has a very small genome. Mm. So it was the first, in 2004, it was the uh, first crop genome to be right. sequenced. And that really, uh, that combination of genome sequence and not only just having the sequence, but knowing where what what is so basically the genetic landmarks uh, uh, on the long strands of chromosomes was very important. So from that perspective, uh, Rice today has more than 4,000 genomes that have been resequenced, mm -hmm. which uh, which is uh, the biggest resource among all the crop plants that we know. Uh, you know, similar progress to, uh, you know, the genomic progress has also advanced in the last few years for wheat, which has several times bigger genome, even a bigger genome than uh, what human genome is. Mm -hmm. uh, so there crea that creates a lot of challenges. However, there's a good, uh, good conservation of w the order of genes that occurs mm -hmm. in many of these crops. Mm -hmm. So it's not a perfect order, but it generally gives us a sense of if we discover things in rice that can itself have a very tremendous effect, but we can, with some level of certainty, <coughs> can go to and look for genes in the corresponding uh, region in wheat. Right. So just to clarify, it's not something that, you know, you could go, okay, I know this, so I definitely know this. But what you could get is that if this kind of traits in this neighborhood in the rice genome, you kind of have, you know, a, a broader zip code, if not the exact address, in many cases. Yeah. So it really, uh, and you know, the, with the sequencing technology almost becoming cheaper and better and more accurate uh, nearly every year, you know, things are, are just get, going to get better and better. Uh, what we do really need in terms of research, especially in terms of temperature, would be better infrastructure because, in, for instance, in case of uh, uh, drought, you could hold or you know withhold or impose or irrigate and you can do the treatment whereas in case of heat stress it's 
going to be very difficult. So that's uh, something that we're, you know, the genomics is there, but the, the technologies on the infrastructure side uh -huh. would be where the, the gap is. Today. Yeah, in all, all transparency, and Harkamal knows this, so, uh, it's hard for me sometimes to relate to our students today um, that it was when they were being born, you know, it's, it's that, that much time is hard to believe it's elapsed already. When the human genome was sequenced in the early 2000s and all of the platform development that that enabled us to lead to, to get, you know, higher density information on these genomes. And Rice, you're right, was, was the first big one in the plant arena. I remember really well here at Nebraska yep. uh, in 2010, I think it was, the International Wheat Genome sequencing consortium that your colleague Steve Banziger was involved in, in helping and you worked with, I yep. think, as well. So it's great to see these technologies continue to develop in that way. Um, so you, you've chosen to work in rice, very heavily in rice, and you were working in that before you came to Nebraska, as I remember, yep. um, in your initial time here. Um, why, you, you talked a little bit about the importance of rice and the importance of it as a staple in the world food diets. You know, talk a little bit more about why you initially focused on, on working in rice. Yeah, so a large part of my research program uh, is in rice, uh, and that's because of uh, several reasons. We've discussed the increased access to, uh, to genomic resources, but what's also quite uh, powerful in rice as a crop, and you know, there's other crops too that do that, but you know, uh, is the ability to do genetic uh, transformation. So mm -hmm. basically, uh, it's very, very easy for most labs to make gene edits, which basically would change DNA sequence, and of course it requires transgenics, but you, would, you can remove the transgene, so it would be mm -hmm. a more of a gene edited uh, technology. So that in rice uh, is quite fast, mm -hmm. and you could do it in many genetic backgrounds, which mm -hmm. really is not something that is as tractable, for instance, in wheat because of just the genome characteristics. Uh, it's called polyploidy, uh, where yep. you have multiple genomes in the same, uh, right. same nucleus, which really uh, you know, creates some complication in terms of it's doable, but it mm -hmm. creates complication in terms of uh, targeting specific changes. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, uh, my, plant, my plant breeding friends for years have told me how easy it is to work in a diploid as compared to a hexaploid, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, just as you, you uh, uh, mentioned. So you, you talked in your presentation about your work on nighttime temperatures as a, you know, the increase in nighttime temperatures being a stressor that that is uh, what you're really evaluating against. And you talked about rice work. Do, you, do we know much about that in maize, given the importance of maize here in Nebraska? Well, there's not been, a, as far as I know, there's not been a very detailed study. But what we do know um, is through s uh, several modeling studies uh, that had taken historic data for maize, uh, uh, what we know is that the uh, years such as 2009 had uh, cooler nights and similar rainfall to the years such as 2010 mm -hmm. uh, in Nebraska, Iowa, in the in that region. And the, however, the July and August temperature of 2010 uh, was uh, on average about five times warmer mm -hmm. at night night, and that um, yeah, was one of the you know reasons they think that the uh, the yields of uh, maize in the Midwest or in, the, in Nebraska, Iowa, uh, were lower. Even though we got the same amount of precipitation, mm -hmm. just the nights were warmer. Uh, besides that, uh, there is uh, some evidence from historic data where um, they've shown that the, for instance, the counties uh, in Nebraska, Iowa, and Indiana, um, oh, sorry, Illinois, the the counties that had high, are hotter were showing, in general, uh, uh, a less degree of uh, yield increase mm -hmm. from growing similar uh, maize varieties. Mm -hmm. So the counties that had uh, lower temperatures showed greater yield gains, even though the yield gains were 
there, but they were not uniform, and the counties in the southern part of, for instance, Nebraska uh, had lower yield gains, and mm -hmm. they think it's because of uh, overall higher temperature. The, uh, that study did not separate the daytime from the nighttime. Right, right. You, you talked, you mentioned a few minutes ago, and you mentioned it in your talk, uh, gene editing technology, CRISPR, you know, is the, the mechanism for that. Uh, do, you, do you see a lot of promise in that technology relative to being able to, to develop you know, crops and crop varieties that will be able to respond better to these kinds of stressors? Yeah, I think the, the gene editing technology in this form or in a, in a future more targeted form is going to play an important role. Um, the, the, the challenge would, of course, be that you can make a change in one variety background. It, it's not guaranteed that it's going to have uh, the same effect in, an, in another uh, background. So that's something that you know, needs to be addressed because it's called the genomic context. So you can make a change, but it may not have the similar you know, impact in terms of, let's say, in terms of high night temperature tolerance. So that's something that would need to be addressed. But I definitely think that unless something dramatically improves in, uh, in, with a new technology, which we don't know, it may right be happening you know, as we speak, but uh, one form or the other of better targeted uh, gene editing without any uh, uh, transgene uh, is going to you know, be part of our future agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you, you, you had one of, I was struck by one of your, your graphics where you talked about the four or five ways that we could address this issue, right? Adaptability being one of those, genetic improvement being one amongst others. So it, how, have, we, have we really understood yet fully what the adaptability part will mean? And by adaptability there, I mean adaptability of the environment in which crops are being produced. You know, it's been striking in recent years the growth north in, in hardiness zones, if you want to think about it, that growing season yeah. um, conditions and corn being grown in parts of Canada that corn was never grown in, yeah. you know, historically and that kind of adaptation. So there's a combination of all of these things, right, that, yeah. that you see how that will happen. Is, do you have any thoughts on what the relative importance of those might be, um, where we grow and how we grow versus, you know, just the genetic improvement itself. Yeah, I think that uh, that will be one of the major uh, players of in terms of how we react to these changes. Uh, farmers, I mean, farming is one of the first organized operation of you know our civilization. Mm -hmm. you know, that's how we built this uh, civilization is around you know. Uh, river valleys and you know where water was there. So mm -hmm. I think the adaptation uh, definitely in the in terms of the uh, the temperate uh, zone, not as much in the tropical, would um, uh, be quite possible. Uh, in fact, I think that the uh, based on what I've read, you know, I'm not a climatologist, but uh, from what I've read, um, the the the, uh, the latitudes around 40s is where it, the maximum gain may be from even increasing uh, higher you know CO2 fertilization. Basically, if carbon's what's limiting, you know having more carbon uh, in not as warmer temperatures is going to um, benefit agriculture. And of course, you know as we push you know a kilometer up north in terms of a range of a crop across the U.S. or Canada is a fairly large you know. Uh, a band of land mm -hmm. and for, for productivity. Uh, what I think, uh, uh, from my understanding of literature, is that the tropics where the species are not as accustomed to large variation in temperature, mm -hmm. like what we are and this you know, plant species in Nebraska, mm -hmm. uh, that's where maybe there's a lot more uh, challenges. Uh, so, so yes, I think the the primary front, since it's farming, the farmers would be the prime, you know, the the main front and the center of this adaptation, backed by better technology, predictions, and genetics. Mm -hmm. uh, I also was struck, and we've had a couple of questions come in uh, during your talk about, 
there, there's a lot of discussion currently in our society about how well understood this problem is. At climate change in general, right? Climate yeah. change and variability and the change in that over time and causes of that over time and adaptation to that is, is not one of the better understood th things uh, um, culturally. But uh, as an observation, you know, I've certainly noticed in the last you know, 10 years in Nebraska, the production agriculture community embracing this at a much higher level and understanding this issue. And the way they have understood it is by experiencing it, right? They're, you know, I'm, I'm uh, thought about Keith, Keith Herman, the chair that you, you hold and great honor that you have to hold the Herman Chair of Agronomy. Yeah. Longtime farmer in Nebraska who understands this yeah. and who sees this I uh, think that's very, very, very positive uh, as well. So Harkamal, wonderful lecture. Congratulations to you on your, your work and your continuing work in addressing these challenges. We're so proud to have you on our faculty at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and the work that you're doing and on a wonderful lecture. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask everyone virtually to give you a big round of applause for okay. a wonderful Nebraska lecture. And thank you for being with us. Thank you, Chancellor Green. Thank you.